Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let's start, as you've been good enough to come here through the snow or through lunch to get here on time. I'm Nick Gowing, and thank you very much indeed. I'm chairing this on behalf of the, the forum to try and get a real buzz going about the issues um, of uh, leadership, of business, of governance, and the new realities uh, out there. We're going to run until about 2.25. It would be great if you could stay on uh, as long as that, if, you, if possible, because what I want to do is get a sense in this room of where the new cutting edge is, where the new frontiers are, and frankly, how brave you're prepared to be about thinking about the new realities in business and first, particularly leadership that we want to lay out in front of you. All of you are part of this brainstorming, so don't think you can just sit on your hands and remain silent. Um, if at 2.26 you come to me and say, I didn't get a chance to say anything, then that's your fault because I'd like to hear from you sooner rather than later. We're trying to develop the whole theme of the, the annual meeting is about the great transformation with new models, finding new models. Uh, and the, the challenges of business, particularly for leadership, are very clear and very stark, as we'll hear in a moment. Uh, there's great scrutiny of business, new expectations, even if it's based on public perceptions and emotions, some of which you don't agree with. That's the reality out there, as confirmed in uh, much of the polling that's going on. So we're looking for transformative ideas, not for 10 years, but maybe 10 months from now. It's that urgent, new models, to match those public expectations and the perceptions. Try and break out of that mindset, if you can, here on this Wednesday afternoon in the heaviest snow that Davos has seen for 66 years, so I'm told. It's an opportunity for business to reposition itself, particularly uh, through leadership. I'd like to hear from you. Big, bold ideas, please. If you're sitting on them and you want them heard and you want them debated, now's the time to start as a springboard, as a catalyst for the next three or four days uh, here in Davos. Um, and you perhaps might want to provide an acceptable reason why some of what is out there is simply misunderstood. But you're going to have to argue that um, uh, pretty, uh, pretty toughly, I think. Now, we're webcasting live. I'm not doing this for the BBC. I'm here in a personal capacity. It is being webcast live. And part of the fun of this is trying to get social media uh, to work. Um, uh, we have a live Twitter feed with the public and in the room. And you can see on the central screen there, there's a Twitter feed. It's quite distant, I know. But that's the Twitter feed, both from in here and out there. And on the right-hand side uh, is the, the address for you. If you want to Twitter and talk to me here without necessarily raising your hand immediately, then my job is to try and put that into the debate. It's an experiment. Let's see how it works. And um, if you don't like Twitter or you don't like what you've got in your pocket or you don't use a mobile phone, I'm quite happy to take a bit of paper from you and we'll convert it into a tweet or some way of getting it uh, into the, the space here. Now, who do we have in the room? Uh, by invitation, we have a lot of business leaders. You know who you are, and we'll hear from many of you uh, over the next uh, hour and a quarter. And the new introduction for the forum this year, the Global Shapers, they're between age 20 and 30 from the new Shapers community. They're young entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs, selected because they're already shaping our future. And frankly, they may have a different view of leadership than some of you uh, in the room. We want to hear from them. Also, the Global Agenda Councils have been working on this kind of issue for the last three years. Um, representatives of those GACs are in the room. I want to hear from you about whether this is meeting the kind of challenges you've already laid out. Have you frankly been bold enough? Now, uh, we'll end the conversation around 2.15 because I'm hoping then that uh, Bill George, Professor of Management Practice at Harvard, um, will then somehow bring together what you've done and what you've not done, whether you've been bold enough or not. But Bill, I think I ought to uh, just turn to you at this stage and say, do you think those gathered in this room can be bold enough on these critical issues? Absolutely. Absolutely, but it's exactly what you said. It's all about leadership. I just came from a session where everyone's talking about what Angela Merkel is going to say when, this afternoon. I think we need to stop waiting for government leaders and other people to tell us what to do. People, the real actions are going to be taken by individuals, by companies, by entrepreneurs who start things, make something happen now. Uh, the government systems are probably going to be frozen for the next, next decade. I hate to say that, and so I think, yes, they will do their job, but I think each of us 
are the only ones that can grow the economy around the world are us as individuals, and we need everyone to step up and lead at all levels. It's not a question of title or size or anything like that. It's a question of leadership at all levels of an organization. All right, Bill, thank you very much indeed. Let me just give you two minutes uh, for a bit of speed dating around your table. Uh, would you just introduce yourselves? Let's uh, loosen the atmosphere a little bit, and I'll come back to you in three minutes. Okay, one minute left and then we'll move on, please. All right, well, I hope you've speed dated enough, uh, and uh, no doubt you'll get to know each other uh, even better in the next hour. Uh, let me give you a sense, if I can, of the kind of uh, tweets we've already been getting coming in uh, before and during the beginning uh, of this session. Uh, there you can see some of them, and I, I refer you there to number 11, um, which is uh, from Zakia Ibrahim, uh, narrowing the gap between the rich and the poor. Uh, the, the brainstorm needs to narrow the gap between the rich and the poor. Salaries to be in line with costs of most basic products. Um, Annika Mik Mikkelsen, uh, I've got a long list. They're coming in very quickly here, so bear with me as I just give you a sense of what's coming in. Uh, saying the business is part of society, thus needing and feeding it, must be sensitive 
to even political surroundings to uh, adapt uh, and survive. Uh, here, uh, another one which has uh, just come in uh, earlier on, uh, number 10 I'm looking at, evaluating the true social and ecological costs of products and services, and secondly, equal support and payment for women, and thirdly, design. That's the kind of sense, as you can see, we're well up to 43 already. Uh, I've got to somehow harvest this for your benefit to input into the discussion. I'd like now to, to ask um, two uh, chief executives and, and presidents to give us some of the metrics that are out there from the polling. Uh, in a moment to Richard Edelman, uh, President and CEO of Edelman, but first to Barry Salzberg, Global CEO from Deloitte, because the metrics and the data are important to inform your view of how mindsets have got to change. Barry, the floor is yours. Th thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we at Deloitte have done a number of surveys of the millennial generation uh, in order to really understand the views of that group of folks uh, as it relates to a fundamental set of questions. What is the purpose of business? How are we improving society through business? How can we achieve even greater positive impact uh, on society? So up on the screen uh, in front of you is the answers to the first set of questions that we asked. And I think that there is resounding alignment, although about a 30% differential in terms of the support, for the concept of how do you measure business's success with, with the result being that 92% that of the millennials and 71% of business leaders that we also surveyed concluded that success should be measured by more than profit. So first data point, incredibly important for us to begin the dialogue. If you look at the second slide, we asked them to identify uh, what is the purpose of business. And this little wordle, what we call it up on the screen, is the response from the millennials. The bigger the font, the more the response. So when you look up on this slide, our millennial generation puts as number one societal development and number two innovation, both ahead of profit, prosperity, and livelihood. If you go to, to the next slide, you can see what the business leaders responded to the very same question. Profit was the number one response by a wide margin with, with society and value being right behind it. So what we have in front of us uh, are three different data points that I think will set the stage for the conversations that we need to have today, questions that we need to deal with about what is the role of business in society. Um, one other point that we asked. We asked, what does your core business contribute to society? 71% of business leaders were clear that their business makes a really valuable contribution to society. But only 25% of them believe that anybody else believes that. And so that is the fundamental discussion that we could have today. Nick? Anything particularly, Barry, on the quality of leadership and the way leadership has to change? The, the, the millennial survey also indicated to us that the number one attribute for the millennial generation to describe future leaders was inspiration. And number two was long-term goals, focusing on the long-term, not just on short-term. So that's a, a little bit more about what the millennials were looking at. Okay, Barry, we'll come back to you later. Let's now pick up. Does anyone want to, to challenge Barry or just get any clarification on any of those data points and particularly the graphics at this point? Please feel you can come in at any point. Yes, at the back. Was there any geographical um, distinctions? Could you just, Malini, could you just say it again, please? Yeah, um, were there any distinctions in terms of geography? Yeah, yep. No, there were no distinctions in terms of geography. Remember, the millennials that we tested were just over 1,000 Deloitte employees who were millennials through 11 countries. So we got a pretty nice dispersion, but no, no real difference by geography or by age group even within the millennials, nor anything uh, differentiating uh, from the business leaders that we, we surveyed as well. Anyone else want to come in, any of the global shapers uh, here? No, I see. You're going to have to put your hands up quickly, otherwise I'm going to move on. Richard Edelman, uh, President and uh, Chief Executive of Edelman. And you said earlier today, Richard, I was at your breakfast briefing, that uh, you mustn't think you can go forward based on the business practice of 08. 
Okay, let me try and give some detail. Could you stand in the light a little? Stand Richard, in the light. So we can see you. Okay, perfect. All right, so we do a study across 25 countries, 30,000 people, and it's on trust, trust in institutions. What we saw this year is an incredible demise of trust in government. Government had seized the initiative after the debacle of 08, 09, bailing out business, obviously re-regulating, but what's happened, as Professor George said so accurately, is business can see is government's gone into paralysis. And our strong suggestion to all of you is don't wait for government to come out of paralysis, go and lead. And I'll give you some data points and then I'll come around to a hypothesis. The first data point is to understand just that business is still not trusted. CEO trust in one year dropped from 50% to 38%. It's much worse in some other countries. The issue is not making jobs and also this pay differential. People are saying, I'm mad about you know, sort of the Occupy Wall Street thematic. Um, who is credible? Look at an average person, an employee. An average employee is twice as believable as a chief executive. That is an important thing to see. Second, I want you to see on the screen, I think it's behind me, if I can go to the uh, uh, next slide. Um, we asked specifically 15 criteria. What gives you trust in a corporation? And in 2008, before the crash, it was, do you make the numbers? Do you have a terrific CEO? Are you delivering a lot of new products? In 2011 and 2012, those criteria are at the very bottom of what gives you trust in a corporation. I think Barry's data is exactly right. We're gonna corroborate it. What does it? Treating employees well. Absolutely having a sense that, that business is delivering on societal goals, um, that uh, you're an open and transparent operation. So societal and engagement factors. The operative parts people are sort of taking for granted. They're assuming that business operates well. What they don't assume is that business understands its role as a positive force in society. So hypothesis. We think that business has to take on the issues of the day, whether it's fracking, whether it's fees for financial services. Make your case, but do it differently. The theory that we have is stop riding your car right on the guardrail. Drive your car in the middle of the lane. Realize that you have to have societal acceptance, not just shareholder acceptance. That you have to also go for this concept of radical transparency. That you've got to tell your employees what you're doing, why you're doing it, but also be accountable. Say, here's our goals, here's the measurability, we've achieved this far. And recognize also that um, in the end, it's not just operational things that you should measure, it's societal and, and uh, engagement factors. Mr. Gowing, over to you, sir. Before you sit down, though, make your case is what you said. What kind of case does have to be made based on your sampling? Nick, it's clear to us that the thing that people want is jobs and that business is a jobs creator. Jamie Dimon had a press release that was very smart this morning. It leads with not the figures for J.P. Morgan, which the quarter is usually pretty decent, but how many jobs we created, how many small businesses we financed, what we're doing to make um, business go better. That's the lead story. You can't go back to 08 and just say, because we make money, we're good. That's not good enough. All right, thanks, Richard. Does anyone want to come back at uh, Richard, ask him about data points, data sampling, uh, and the next stage? Anyone, please, in the room? Yeah, is it Ernst? Yeah, it's Ernst, hi. Um, one Could you just introduce yourself, Ernst? Ernst Lichtling, Global Reporting Initiative. Global Reporting Initiative sets the standards for environmental, social and governance reporting. Um, Richard just uh, referred to the importance uh, to show what the impact is on jobs. Uh, that is at the moment a concern uh, for this moment. Last year it was climate change. What I think is the uh, higher level concern is what is business actually doing for the planet for uh, society wider than that. How are ex actually profits uh, being made? And there we do need more clarity to actually maintain this license of operate and maintain trust. One thing that people do not trust is if there is a gap between, say, the spoken language and the body language of, of, of a company. And in order to achieve more trust there, um, Richard calls it radical transparency. The transparency uh, of business results needs to broaden. If I may for a moment, 
um, the Global Agenda Council on the role of business underlines the importance of that in their uh, summary, which is widely av available here, that is to talk of the need for uh, long-term sustainable um, wealth creation to be actually the focus, or co call it more uh, shared shared value generation. That is the, the, the goal. If a company doesn't demonstrate this nowadays anymore, trust is very difficult to achieve. But not only the spoken words, it is also you have to demonstrate as a company now how you're going to do it, and that's why reporting and transparency is becoming so key. This is rapidly developing, this is becoming more mainstream, as um, is shown particularly in 2011 research by KPMG, last data point, three out of the four countries researched in 34 countries. The majority of the large companies are now disclosing their ESG reporting. Companies that don't do this have really more to explain nowadays than companies that make it a habit to talk about their financial as well as their social, environmental and governance results. Thanks, Dan. Um, a, se a sense of uh, what's coming in at the moment from some of you on the floor and also elsewhere. Um, uh, on the, the tweet, please, if you could just switch, please, um, Dan. Uh, Okay, uh, can you get it up there or not? Well, I'll tell you, it's um, uh, from Rapalan Gram Bana. Let's articulate the roadmap for companies to transform their role in society. And the reason that's up there is because uh, before uh, we uh, gathered here, there was an invitation through social media since uh, Monday morning uh, to uh, come up with your, their views out there. I'll just give you, forgive me, the switching takes a little bit of time here. That's one of the, the views uh, which is out there. Uh, and also uh, from uh, here, Anaposa, uh, who is saying crisis is an opportunity. Right, this is uh, one of the questions which was put out on social media from Monday evening. Now, it's difficult to read, but I will read uh, a sense of what is coming back from out there top there of how business can do better or be better is about ethical business practices, put customers ahead of profits, enhancing giving place for and incentives for creativity, more transparency, innovate, make business accountable to society. Let me move on with the next um, bit of data coming in. What's the responsibility of business towards society? Win-win service and sustainability between all parties involved. And then uh, much smaller responses on working for the markets along with co corporate social responsibility and company keep being company that is the first most important. And finally, uh, the uh, other data points which are out there, again, this is the kind of thing we've been getting in uh, about evaluating the true social and ecological costs of products and service, equal support and payment for women and design. Uh, there are two or three others. Now, let me, is Jim Wallace here on table seven? Jim, could I just come to you? Because um, you were on the, uh, you are on the Global Agenda Council on values in decision making. Give us your reflections. Keep pushing the limits of this discussion, please. We've had long conversations about how the crisis has led to a breakdown in social contracts, implicit, explicit. Things that we thought were the case are no longer. So we're actually drafting a social covenant. Uh, what does it mean to have a new covenant between stakeholders? And let me give you from the faith community a uh, old religious question. Jesus once asked, who, who is my neighbor? Okay, take your cell phone, your iPhone, your Blackberry, that you live with every day, all day, right? This is your constant companion. I would say whoever helped make this device is your neighbor. Think about that. So from a business point of view, how can supply chains become also value chains? These are the new kind of questions we have to start asking. Who is my neighbor? Who helped to make this? How can supply chains become value chains? So the Global Action Council on Values is asking, how can trust be reestablished. We've lost trust. Trust will be established with new kinds of covenants that we agree to make together to each other. Hmm? Are you being radical enough, do you think, in your, in your council, given the way the debate is going, given the data points that are coming through from the surveys? 
I, I think we're, we're asking the fundamental question of trust because trust isn't good for business or politics or society. And we've lost trust. We've lost our whole sense of confidence in how decisions are made. Like, we've had, since the crisis at Davos up there, we've had plenary sessions that I've been a part of. We've had a value seminar at Davos since the crisis. However, the crisis came when bad decisions got made because of bad values. I would say we're having a better conversation about our change in values so far from our changes in decision making. Is decision making really changing on Wall Street or wherever else? That's, I think, the hard, the radical issue is to say how are decisions changing, not just having a good discussion at Davos about values. Thank you. Anyone, uh, f please, Marjorie. Uh, Marjorie Krauss, uh, APCO Worldwide. I just had something I wanted to add as a factor for people to think about, and that is during 2012, while we're having this discussion about the realignment between business and society and government, more than 50% of the world's population will experience some kind of election or change of government. And so um, we have, amidst all of this, whether you think it's uncertainty as an opportunity or a problem, what's going to come out of the recession are governments that are smaller, that have less resources, that are less experienced, that um, will probably be less innovative. Um, there's a huge opportunity in that to, if we can get this right, to create a very different kind of model. And it's just... Um, something I thought was interesting in light of what we're talking about. Marjorie, that's a useful, useful aspiration, but from your corporate perspective, where is leadership failing at the moment? What, what more <laughs> needs to be done? Well, I think there is no, there's no, certainly on the government side, there's no leadership. And um, we've, uh, I think, um, moved into a situation where there is paralysis. So there, there is, and then in government, I think, I mean, in business, I think most people are just wanting to um, not get in trouble is the best way I could say it. So there's a real opportunity and I think there's some very progressive companies that take the lead and I agree with the CEOs that don't get credit for it. And so part of this is also figuring out not only what to do but how to convince people that what's being done is actually in everybody's best interest. Thanks Marjorie. Anna Posa, are you here? Um, please, I want to come to you because you're tweeting a lot on this. Please, and you, you uh, could you all introduce yourself? Yes, hi, I'm, I'm Anna Bossa. I am a global shaper from Manila, Philippines. Yes. And your view, because you're beginning to tweet, uh, and you're, you're expressing concern about the role of business in this new environment, yes, in I your think, perspective. Okay, thank you. Um, I think there just needs to be a lot of intergenerational responsibility when we make decisions in business. Also, there has to be a multi-stakeholder dialogue because, you know, environmentalists, for instance, think that all corporate there's a stand that all corporations are bad, which which it's not the case if we just open the dialogue and learn more about each other's points of view. And I think I tweeted earlier that crisis is an opportunity. I mean, we've been seeing economic and political crises the past few years, and it's a perfect opportunity to create new models. There. Do you think there's a will for new models? Yes, definitely. Because Richard Edelman's point was that there's a danger of defaulting to where things were in 08, 09. Um, there's more will now, and I think there's also greater awareness from younger people to push for that. Um, I was in the social media session earlier, and it says that um, 20 years ago, graduates of MIT usually start businesses when they're 37, and now the average age of entrepreneurs is 27 years old. So you see that there's a growing... Um, interest from younger people to shape but, the world. Okay, how disappointed are you at the moment in the quality of leadership from what you see in the Philippines? <laughs> um, very disappointed, but I also think that if, I tweeted it earlier as well, that if the people will lead, the leaders will follow. I'm sort of in this position that I don't rely on the government anymore. Um, I wouldn't say I'm apathetic because I still need them to, to propel my, my agenda forward, but I'm not going to wait for them to do something. And I'm not going to make excuses for myself as a young person. I'm not going to say that. Oh, just because I'm 23 years old, I'm incapable of dual, doing things. So, okay, thank you very much indeed. Could you just put up the tweets, please? 
Hi, um, my name is Catherine Mashansky. I'm a global shaper from San Francisco, and I direct a public-private partnership that works to address climate change called the Business Council on Climate Change. Uh, and I think uh, what was said before about how business really needs to integrate externalities into their business models, and that's where the real change can come, and that's where the real transformation is coming. And I say that, I think, in response to something that was said during the global business context uh, event this morning. You had some amazing CEOs from wonderful companies talking about uh, the challenges challenges that they face as CEOs and, uh, and what they're doing to address some of the issues that society faces. And all of them were talking about uh, crisis management and disaster relief and addressing world hunger and energy poverty and, and amazing issues that they're taking on as part of their CSR departments or their foundations, which is, is great, but how much more impact could you have if you transform your business model to not create those problems in the first place? Uh, and as an example of something we're doing in San Francisco that I think is really inspiring is in this public-private partnership. We are harnessing the ability and the opportunity that all of these businesses have to actually create the social change through their firm. So we ask our businesses to take certain actions to transform their business models to address these pressing social issues. So what's issues. your challenge here in Davos to this kind of gathering at yeah. the beginning of the whole session? I think create a roadmap for how your business can uh, address some of these social uh, uh, issues in your, in your business as the core of your business while also generating profit, which I recognize is, is the, the most important thing that a business needs to do to, to, to survive. Please. Uh, my name is Havil Khurakiwala. I'm the chairman CEO of Vokat, which is a healthcare pharmaceutical biotech company. I, I believe the business has to recreate a new business model uh, in the sense that... <clears throat> I think we all agree on that. What we're yeah, not trying the, to do the, is the move model, it forward. The, mo the model which I'm suggesting is that the, in addition to business, I think one must create relevancy of your business with the society and community as a part of a business model, not as a part of CSR activity. And uh, this makes uh, two very good business sense. One, that one is always relevant to what you are doing, and long-term sustenance of business is possible. Uh, and therefore, we'll just give you an example of our own uh, company where we are in pharmaceutical healthcare. We have a foundation uh, which takes care of healthcare delivery into the whole system, which is part of a CSR activity. But the very fact that we are in that, you do research, you do innovation, and that is where you continue to become uh, kind of a relevant. And I think that is where one has to revisit the business. Thank you. Barry, I saw you nodding your head there. Do you want to just come in? And then I'll go to uh, others on your table. Yeah, just just a, a quick uh, affirmation of your point of view that, that from, from the research that we have done, the millennial generation absolutely wants that integrated responsibility of, of societal and business impact together. So that the core of business is business. And to drive societal impact, we need to consider new models, new ways of doing business, but stay true to the underlying product and services that each of the businesses are producing. Thank you. Pass the microphone to your right. Hi, I'm Tay Yu with Cisco. I, I think that this is a really rich dialogue that's been happening for a long time inside corporations. You probably aren't familiar with it, but I want to be very careful that when we talk about CSR, quote, activities, that they're not, CSR isn't a bunch of activities. It's really about sustainability and how you manage the company, how you treat your employees, how you look at the supply chain and the impact it has on the environment. Um, and I think that what, one of the trends that you can see is rather than saying we need to create the business, use the CSR agenda to integrate and work on and influence the new business model. So for instance, a lot of us are looking at healthcare and we're, you know, IT is going to play a huge role in how care is delivered and the quality of the care and access to, to healthcare. And to build a business around something that addresses a social issue but is part of your co core profit making business is where the CSR is integrated into your business. So I, I want to be very careful we don't just separate it as a bunch of activities that you do just to make things right from a PR perspective, because it's much deeper than that. Let me just pick up and then pass the microphone across, give you a sense of what else is happening out there, and maybe from within the room, I don't know you all, of course, 130 up there. The problem is the world is a monetary system. Take away that money and change it to a resource system. The next one down, intergenerational approach, will create new models of business responsibility. We no longer depend on governments and corporations anymore. I'm just giving you a, a sample here of the kind of thing that's, that's coming in. 
uh, at the moment. We need to change our business culture. Nadia Zen is uh, tweeting a lot. Are you in the room? You are? Okay, I'll come to you in a moment. Um, uh, scary thought, the average employee is more believable than the CEO. Um, WEF results will be measured not only with numbers, but what you are doing for the world. That's the sense which is coming through digitally, please. Hey, I'm Geronimo, I'm a Global Shaper 2. Um, just a follow up on the Geronimo results. Geronimo Cadron. Yes, exactly. Okay, and you run a company called Euphoria. Exactly, it's a social business actually. So, and it's linked to that. We walk the talk from already. Mexico. From Mexico. I'm originally from Bolivia, okay. but I live in Switzerland. Okay. And I, I'm not sure if in your survey you also looked at values in, in general. We're also very impatient. And I feel very impatient right now. Because everyone is talking, it sounds like we agree, right? We need to change things. Let's walk the talk. This morning I was in a session with Muhammad Yunus, and he was saying, businesses should ask themselves, what's my USP? And then look to what is the problem that I can solve with that USB? And how can I integrate that without necessarily making, you know, only a financial profit? And I would like to start talking about that, like the concrete solutions. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I might come back to you at the end and ask you whether we've satisfied your concerns. Please, across here. And then we'll come, who else over here? Get the microphone there, please. Yes. Stuart Wallace from the New Economics Foundation and also on the Values Council. And in the past, I've run some businesses as well. I think the key thing that we've got to do is a, a major shift from seeing profit as the end purpose to seeing profit as the means to an end, to a wider purpose. And we still have to make profits, crucial. But I think businesses need, as entities, to define wider purposes. And they'll vary. But until we have a sense of a wider purpose and profit being the means to an end, we won't make a big transformation. What are the implications, therefore, for leadership and those on boards who have to set the tone and the course for well, a major the, corporation? Some leaders say we're stuck with the markets. I think the, most, the strongest leaders say, no, we can deliver for the markets, but we will deliver a wider purpose. So it's actually setting out a vision and a purpose, agreeing it with their stakeholders and going for it, and they'll probably make better profits as a result, but the profits becomes the means, Can not the end. Can you just spin the microphone forward again to Barry? But because, Barry, profit was one of the big words on your cloud there. Do you want to respond to that quickly, based on the data you have? The, the, the data that we have would just indicate that there's a, a difference of perspective in terms of today. Uh, and I think that the, the dialogue that we need to have here today and brainstorm is how to, how to migrate in that in the world of inconsistency. Okay, thank you. Please. Hi, my name is Sandeep Naik. I'm a young global leader uh, and a private equity investor. So some of this might sound a bit dry, but I struggle with this kind of a conversation because the content here is extremely rich in terms of what's been said. Uh, but in terms of walking the talk of some of the people saying that it's not a part of your CSR activity, it's a part of the business, how do you actually implement it? And unless I fundamentally believe that unless there's a carrot or a stick that actually gets people to walk that talk, it becomes very difficult for people to actually implement it. It's a great dinner table conversation, but at the end of it, you know, there's no action that results from it. When you say it's rich and you're finding it overwhelming, should we be slowing down the discussion? I mean, when I'm trying to push it forward. I'm not being facetious here. But these are critical issues, as we just heard from Hieronimo here, uh, that, that there's an impatience out there. Uh, I, I think we, we should slow it down a bit because what we're getting is we're getting a lot of flashpoints of ideas. But if you can take a couple of them and really drill down to the next level as to, okay, what do we do with it? And, and what's the most tangible thing that the leaders in this organization can do with, with their, within their businesses? I think it, it might be helpful at least for me. Richard, can I come, Richard Edelman, can I come to you? Because uh, impatience being expressed here, but a concern that this all may move too fast even if that's the perception that your survey like yours is recording, an expectation of something happening swiftly? I think that uh, business leaders who are smart are going to set out a long-term vision. And if they try to meet it every quarter, they're going to have a problem. And, and frankly, I think Paul Pullman is wise at Unilever in saying, I'm not going to do quarterly estimates. I'm going to be setting myself a five-year plan. And you can measure other things besides profit. You can actually measure your supply chain. You can measure customer satisfaction. You can be quite open with your employees and letting them um, be up on Twitter. So I think you have to have different 
goalposts. If you don't measure the societal and the engagement aspects just like you measure operational, you've got problems. Because we only measure operations now, mostly. But what about the impatience and, and the fact there's a danger of it going too fast, this contradiction we've already exposed here, based on your data? You know, Nick, I, I think you see just tremendous uh, disgust for business um, in terms of that CEO statistic, and you see real disdain for government. Go forward. Um, it, the greater risk is to do nothing right now. Okay, please. Uh, hi, um, Tara Setilwani from, from... Could you just stand up? Sorry, Tara Setilwani from South Africa. Just a couple of points. I, I think one of, this, one of the issues we're missing here is that part of leadership is following. Um, it, and, and society is basically telling us they have certain expectations of us. Um, whether we like it or not, we have to respond as businesses to those societal expectations. Part of the problem is that the way businesses are rewarded, and I'm not talking individuals, I'm just talking markets and what have you, are not aligned with the societal expectations. So a sensible starting point for me would be to look at how we align society's expectations with the rewards um, um, that we put businesses under because a lot of chief executives will be very nice and tell you about all sorts of things and, 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 and many of them mean it, but at the end of the day, the reward systems in terms of their share price, in terms of everything, are totally different from society's expectations, and that is what they're going so to So put on to. the table what the new realities mean for the new uh, direction for leadership. The new direction for leadership for me um, says you're, you're going to have to have some hard, difficult conversations with your stakeholders as to why there is a long-term benefit in going down certain routes that may not necessary to give them short-term benefits on the quarteritis syndrome that we all suffer from in our businesses. Right, right at the back, you've got the microphone. Thank you. Uh, I'd like Could you introduce yourself, please, yes. and speak is, up a little bit? My name is Linda Freed. I'm the Dean of the School of Public Health at Columbia University. And I actually want to follow on the gentleman who just spoke. We are. Conf I understand Richard's comments on the paralysis, uh, perceived paralysis of government, on the potential perception of failure of corporations to lead. One of the challenges we might have is that we are confronted with a number of what I call silent emergencies as a world and as a society, which all sectors have to be part of the solution of, and we have to have some compact, I think, around where those solutions are because they require long haul working together and not in silos. And so I would be interested from, from this eminent group in terms of what those structures might be that could accomplish that. Thank you. Who's got the microphone next? Microphone here, please, and then to you. And then we'll go to table 11, please. Hi, Michelle Green from NYSE Euronext. Um, I just want to... Uh, attack a premise that seems to be underlying a lot of these comments, which is that sustainability necessarily has to be in conflict with profits. I, I don't think that's the case. And I actually view one of the roles of CSR within a company as identifying those opportunities and making people throughout the company, in this idea of infusing it throughout the company, making people throughout the company see and identify those opportunities in their own areas of operations where we can align sustainability and profits. And I think that's what good CR is actually about. Don't sit down. Up there, a tweet 153, CSR is not enough change the whole business model well, to that's idealistic. My, that's my point exactly. My point exactly is that CSR is not a standalone do it over here in a silo. Those people in that room are responsible for sustainability. What CR done well is, is reimagining every aspect of the business and integrating the ideas of CR to everyone within the organization so that they can see the opportunities within their own area to do their business in a sustainable way. And it can, cre it can actually enhance profits. It can create opportunities that weren't there when you weren't thinking through this lens. Right, let me go there, please. David Harland, I run a... Uh, Say again, please. David Harland, I run a private mediation organization. Thank you very much, Nick. What strikes me about the debate so far is uh, to what extent there is agreement at the, the headline level, headline slash bumper sticker level. And I, and I very much agreed with the point about 
uh, slowing down for a second and, and asking how how can the corporate good citizen be that and still be profitable as a, as a means to a greater end and um, one of the things that strikes me is that the poverty comes up in a lot of these tweets the single biggest driver of poverty in our world is armed conflict um, armed conflict is, uh, whether it's Congo or Sudan or, or elsewhere, it provides tremendous opportunity for the corporate sector to, to engage. Okay, and but I want to keep you focused on the quality of leadership in yes. the existing organizations and the way Barry and Richard have set this up. So keep on that, that axis, For sure, for sure. And uh, it seems to me there is, an, there is an aversion to risk that is very much uh, understandable and it's very hardwired into our systems that our corporate sector and its leadership will avoid the, the risky areas. And yet there is a good model already for engaging and creating the partnerships that can not only produce great profits, but can um, produce wider good as well. Thank you. John DeJoya, uh, you're on the Council for Values in Decision Making. Thanks, Nick. Um, I just want to pick up on a point that Jim Wallace made and connected to Geronimo's point. If we think about the smartphone and we think about the value chain, that the supply chain that enables us to create that smartphone, are we prepared for the sacrifices that may be required of all of us? We recognize that from Stuart Wallace's work, we know that the inequalities that we deal with require significant changes in the models that we're talking about. But if, if we walk that supply chain, we're going to find some things that we know we can't live with. And all of us are going to have to make some sacrifices. And are we prepared to do that? What do you think, the, John, before you sit down, what do you think the answer to your own question is in terms of the mindsets, the willingness to change, what Richard said, make your case? No, I think that, that this is the most significant challenge that we all face. Every one of us is going to have to find a way to be able to move forward innovating, creating, adapting, and, and building new models. But we, we're, we are all going to have to make some sacrifices along the way. We're going to have to do with less. Thank you, John. Bill, can I just come to you? Are we making progress, or are they sitting on their hands a bit? No, I think we're definitely making progress. I think we're, in some ways we're talking around each other, saying the same things, but I think we're recognizing that more than every poor business has to justify its role in society. Society is demanding that. But there is a straightforward way to do that, and that's what we're talking about the new model. So what's your challenge now for the next 25 minutes? Who's going to step up and lead and do it instead of asking someone else to do it? Okay, right. I can see suddenly the hands go up. We have 25 minutes to run. I'm going to make a rule here, which is if you can persuade the microphone in your direction, you speak, okay, rather than waiting for me. Who's got, who's got it next here? And we, you can work it out. We've got about, I'd say, 20 people who want to intervene at this moment. Introduce Hi, uh, yourself. I'm Manju George. I'm a global shaper from India. Um, social entrepreneurs are people who have started with a societal consideration and have tried to create a business around it. Um, I'm wondering if there are any learnings from there. Uh, can that be seen as leadership already demonstrated in trying to integrate business financial considerations and social considerations. What's the challenge which you'd like to put on the table then from your view as a global shaper? What, what, what would you like to hear from here from a meeting like this? So I've seen a lot of good work done by social entrepreneurs. I would like to see how can that how can larger corporations do something similar because social entrepreneur activity is really limited but they've shown that you know you can do business and yet have a societal impact. Right. Thank you. Let's move the microphone. Who's got the microphone now? Fine. Uh, can I just hold for a moment? Because one or two other people haven't spoken, Jim. Is that all right? Would you mind? Who else has got the microphone? There. Let me just... It's John McCulloch Bain, the McCulloch Bain Foundation. I owned a company and we sold in 2006. But I think the reason we're here is not because CSR... I think that question, of, I think it was Olena, was very good. You know, it's not just CSR. If CSR were all it was, we might not be here because CSR theoretically is better today than it was two years ago. I think the reason we're here is two reasons. Number one, the financial crisis started in the United States, and second is the European debt crisis. So here's two sort of very simple questions for everyone. Is Number one is, would we have had the United States financial crisis if we had more downside capitalism, real capitalism, as opposed to upside-only capitalism? So I think the business in the United States today is a lot of CEOs, people are unhappy. They're unhappy because they're making money because they don't, they're not an owner uh, in the business. They don't have downside. And secondly, would we have debt crisis in Europe if everybody had a KPMG or Ernst & Young or 
Deloitte or uh, Price Waterhouse audit in governments. If governments were audited, then there'd be a, a lot of change in the world. I think people wouldn't lend those countries money. A, if they broke their audit, they would go to jail as fraud. Right now, we've got internal audits, nobody accepts them. So we wouldn't lend a penny to any company that's public in the world without an audit, independent audit by a big four, but we'll lend billions to any country that wants, to politicians, with no audit. So I think those are two things that might change the, if those two things didn't happen, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, Richard or, or, or um, uh, Barry, do you want to respond on that? Would your, would your surveys have produced that kind of data if we weren't uh, at the end or the, the next stage of what happened in 2008? Richard or Barry, anything particular? Quickly? If not, Barry, Richard, do you want to talk? Yes or no? No, okay. Barry, do you want? No, okay. Right. Yeah, I, I'm Gen Miyazawa from Global Shippers uh, from Tokyo Hub. Uh, I'd like to share the Japan's case uh, before and after the disaster uh, last year. It's a, a perspective of the long-term uh, sustainability business. Uh, but on the, leadership especially, on leadership, uh, yeah, given I, the yeah, pressures okay, on the government leadership. and TEPCO. Yeah, uh, the, you know, earlier with the disasters, earlier leaders uh, didn't cut the jobs uh, after the uh, quakes. And, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the Basically, uh, what they thought at that time is uh, living close together in this area and uh, the community and the employment. So uh, that's the basement of the management of that area and uh, the leaders. So, uh, so the average of the, the unemployment rate uh, is uh, improved uh, only in Japan uh, before the quake and after the quake. I think it's a very important sustainability to the local and the, the leadership, I think. Can I encourage you to be moving down what John said and what Bill said? It's everyone else's problem rather than mine, to paraphrase them. Ernst, I know uh, you've spoken already, but you have been trying to get the floor. Let me come back to you now, because there was that one comment about CSR. Quickly, please. Okay. Barry's figures showed CEOs largely concerned with profit. That's also on the whole, on the short term. That's not what, mo what the majority of uh, society is interested uh, about, and that's where a big of the, uh, the a lot of the uh, trust gap comes from. This morning was a comment in um, in the discussion of the Global Agenda Council and the role of business. A lot of CEOs in their heart are really really good people. It's the system that blocks them from uh, doing often the right thing. I think that every CEO actually has a great opportunity to start to be a leader to change that. And that is to start to talk about the other results of the, of the company, the other impacts. And that is actually about the relationship to society and environment. The system exists. There is no reason not, not, to, uh, not to do that anymore. And by doing that, we really change the discourse. At the moment, the reason why so many are so shy about it is the dominant discourse is if you don't tell what, what your quarterly results are and how you're doing that, then you're not a CEO that easily makes the, the headlines. That needs to change. Thank you. Down here, please. Uh, Georg Kiel, I'm head of the UN Global Compact, and uh, I get Just extremely, the microphone up a little bit. I'm getting extremely uh, encouraged by many of the comments made. What I want to speak on leadership is the following. First. Trust, of course, must be earned over time, so I'm afraid there's bad news for a quick fix, which you can achieve immediately. So you need a long-term approach, and uh, what Richard in his uh, findings, what KPMG has come out, and what the council has produced are extremely important That's building blocks. Not and Deloitte, sorry, apologies. Uh, secondly, I think a lot of corporations have started that journey already, but the good news is they are getting deeper and deeper in what they're doing and more and more serious. But the bad news is there's still a minority worldwide scene. They don't add yet up to transformation. And you can be a leader only if the others follow. If the others don't follow, then you're actually a fool when you're out there alone by yourself. So I think the biggest challenge for leadership is actually to really make best practices mainstream everywhere so that transformation happens. If five or 10 percent of CO are committed and are integrating environmental, social and governance into their business model, are reshaping strategies to pursue dual strategies, great. But 5% won't change countries, won't change markets. We need critical mass, we need to go to scale. How we can you build that critical mass? Education, the CEOs who are committed should work more in platforms where they inspire and carry along others through their value chain, supply chain, we, they should engage in platforms which help to create coherence 
around the world. You need some anchor and goalposts. We have Rio Plus 20 upcoming, which is an opportunity. But to mainstream leadership now, I think, is the big challenge. So we don't just look at one or two CEOs, but we really make transformation by getting it mainstream. And what Ernst just said, the systemic barriers are still very tremendous, because if investment does not recognize good practices, if consumers don't reward it, then clearly we will stay a, a small movement and we won't go globally either. So we Thank need you. to work on all tracks okay. and the paper here actually is pretty, pretty solid and good. Right, move the microphone across. Could I tell you, you're not alone here, 1400 people are watching the webcast at the moment looking to see how radical you're prepared to be. And I'm going to ask at the moment, is there anyone who's a senior executive, a CEO, who's involved in leadership? who thinks that this is an arid debate and you're comfortable with what you're doing and you don't have to change, because I'd like to hear from you here. Maybe it's just you, others are out there who wouldn't want to uh, be at this, about this question. All right. I'm close. Uh, CEO. Could uh, you just tell us who you are? I'm Doug Fry with Cars International and I am the president and CEO. Um, we do have to change. But I, I did want to answer that question or address the question a little differently in that we have to, we're talking about change. What we're really talking about uh, is changing the environment. So we have to change the environment as well. We, we keep talking about the, a lot of great ideas. Um, in order to change the environment, I think the media has to help. It's missing from this discussion. Uh, this is a great discussion, but the greater discussion that's taking place on the news every night is a short-term discussion. And my example is uh, last night, if anyone watched the news, what covered the news, the financial news, all night? 75%. Apple's short-term earnings. So how do we use the media? How do we get the media to help us in this discussion? Because we need to change the environment. You think we're meant to help you? Well, I think you shape, uh, I do think you shape. Right, Richard, I've got to come to you because part of your findings was about the role of the media in leadership and how the media is keeping leadership's feet to the fire. Well, actually, trust in media grew in the last year substantially. Two reasons. Really being smart about uh, covering the financial issues in the Eurozone and the US. Second, because media is now the big tent. It's not just mainstream media, it's social, it's blogs, it's all of it. And so I actually feel that uh, the way you're doing this debate is indicative of how companies are going to have to run their uh, investor conferences in future, just as a theory. So this could be an investor conference? I mean, if you're thinking 10, 20 years from now, why not? Just what about to put 10, that out there. What about 10 to 20 months? That's a little quick. But forgive me, Richard, I've, yeah. got, to, I've got to press you, but Do. If, if, the, if the issues are that urgent, what we're seeing here in the frustration and the impatience is not a tolerance of waiting too long on these issues. I mean, Nick, look what happened in the uh, bill in uh, Congress, um, the SOPA bill, uh, basically Last the week. sort of grassroots rebellion by, um, stimulated by the tech companies absolutely killed that bill. So it really was this kind of uh, initiative. So let me just come back to you. Uh, there you are. The media is already keeping your feet to the fire. It's a question of how much you are able to preempt and move forward rather than the media catching you up. Well, I, be I believe that uh, social media is heading in the right direction. I think social media is going to give us a bigger push. I think the traditional media, however, can help. And again, I, I point to what's being covered right now, what's interesting, um, in quotes. So yes, I am looking for the media to hop on a, a topic such as social giving. Um, important things that companies are doing that are not directly short-term impacting the bottom line. Let's have a conversation about what's impacting the bottom line over a 10-year period. It's not happening very often. Thank you. Who else has got the microphone, please? So I'm from the media, but I want to speak about something different. Ros Shaw from CNBC. I, I want to say that if, if we want to look at the quality of leadership, we have to look at the composition of leadership. And it's very hard to trust that leaders have really worked as hard as they could do in, in gaining our trust when they are still largely men and a, a large proportion of the talent out there is not being represented. And so, you know, if you try to say to us, trust us, we've found the best people to administer this task, the best people for our board, and they're all, well, mainly men, you know, it just doesn't fly with 50% of the population. So start by doing those basic things, like getting the best people and, and a broader representation of society, and then hopefully some trust might follow from that. Thank you. Who else has got the microphone, please? Yes, I'm sorry, I, I uh, hadn't forgotten you. Monique Leroux from Canada. I'm a CEO of a large financial organization. And one suggestion um, that I would like to share, 
I agree with you who said that profits are essential, essential and very important, but they have to be a tool to achieve a long-term vision for the business, as well as achieve prosperity for people and society. One of the things that uh, we should discuss is that we are very often talking about organizations, profit organizations and non-profit organizations. Maybe we should develop a new model, which is enterprises or businesses for benefit. Benefit of people, benefit of society, benefit of stakeholders, shareholders, so a broader role in business. I'm highly concerned about you know, the fact that there could be you know, uh, this uh, continuous trend in you know, trust, lack of trust between business and people. Uh, I think that uh, if this trend continues, we will be facing a big issue. To conclude, uh, another suggestion, when we talk about businesses, we talk very often about large public corporations, very important in the world. But there are other type of business models, like family-owned business, for example, and cooperative organizations. And they follow a different logic and maybe much more balance between the interests of uh, people and money. Thank you. Thank you. Could I just ask you, do you feel under pressure on, on this leadership issue, on these, these elements which are being put on the floor uh, at a session like this today? Well, uh, those uh, issues uh, are in my mind, and certainly when I look at some of the discussions that we have internally in, a, in my organization and with our members and customers, those issues are highly important. So uh, I think that we need to work on that. And uh, it's uh, with that kind of discussion, I think that we can, each of us, we can contribute to, you know, provide solutions. And do you feel an urgency on this? At the yes, moment? of course. Okay. I'd like to get a Chinese view, um, if I may, from table three. And can I just tell you, we have about 12 minutes to run before we begin to conclude and I go to, to Bill and others. Um, so keep up the momentum. But I want to take up what Bill and, and John said about thinking how this is going to be done. And Nadia, I want to come to you because you're being extremely active uh, on tweets. And I want to just for you to reflect from your perspective towards in, in the next five minutes where you think this is going, because you're laying down a number of challenges on your tweets, which I'll come to uh, in a moment. Uh, let me go to Li Kai Fu, please. OK. Uh, I think all, all of these changes are very much needed. I should uh, say you're founder and chief executive for Innovation Works. Right, thank you. Um, I think in China and probably many parts of Asia, uh, one of the additional challenges in trying to make these transformations is that it's often, it's often family owned business and or founder driven and majority owned businesses. So there is not the same level of accountability and governance. And the question would be, um, it's perhaps more difficult for the people to sort of uh, push up, request or demand or even shareholders to for, to cause the changes to happen. So I think it's really important to think about how in the more traditional family-owned spaces uh, people can uh, gain the self-motivation to make the changes needed. The second comment I want, want to make is that uh, we were discussing earlier about uh, social entrepreneurship uh, versus profits. And I think um, uh, doing the right thing, being good for users and customers, at, as balanced with short-term profit is important. But, but uh, companies are often very, very difficult to run with uh, dual missions. So I would ask uh, if, if people have ideas on how to better balance so that both of these goals are, are, are accomplished rather than one at the complete expense of the other. Thank you. Please don't sit on your hands. We have 10 minutes to run. I'm going to go to the back first and then you, Jim. Yeah. Uh, Rudy Pauls, uh, CEO of Biocartis and Technology Pioneer. I just want to add a point to Nadia in terms of action. My experience in the last year in, in, uh, in raising a lot of capital, capital was rather than going to the stock market is actually address people with resources and it was very remarkable to note that more than 50% were asking, we're not only investing in a company and technology with a long-term goal and I, don't, and I think long-term goals and addressing medical society and needs are, are important, but one of the key points was um, is my money, is my investment going to make any difference? So I truly believe that Although the climate is very important and that all has to change, I think CEOs can already uh, take the first steps. 
uh, in this environment. What, but just be a bit more specific about, about what needs to be done. Let's put something more precise on the table. Well, I, I, I think I fully agree with what is said here. We have to go back and look at the long term. What is it, the kind of products we're developing? Are these really truly addressing uh, society needs? And, and, and do we develop products that in the long term really uh, add value? That's number one. Number two is who are backing up these companies? founders, family, friends, but I see also an increasing interest of large industrial groups, family offices, to really step into this and, and say, okay, we're backing you up rather than the short-term market pressure which, which a lot of CEOs are under. Thank you, okay. This is a where we go from here. Um, I'm encouraged too by the shared values, but the operationalizing of them is still the issue. There's a convergence of values, but there's conflicts between the values. And until we get to the conflicts, we won't get to move, moving forward. For example, on the Congo issue, you, the use of minerals to fund militias. We had a big conversation last week in Washington. Or trafficking and apparel in, in industries. For example, we had an apparel industry say, we'd like to look at our supply chain. We would. But if we do, we will lose competitive advantage with other apparel industries who are not looking at their supply chain. We'd like to, it's our value, but we can't or we'll lose profits. So we've got to identify here the conflict between short term and long term, between shareholders sometimes and stakeholders. So that apparel industry said, if you NGOs could get us together as apparel industries so we could together decide to look at our supply chains, then we could do it and not lose our competitive edge. So until we get down to that level of how to operate, how to walk that talk, we're talking about shared values, but until we talk about how to implement them and what the conflicts are, we're not going to go forward here. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, my name is Ak Yahur. I am a uh, CEO of a large conglomerate from Istanbul, Turkey. I am against this concept of dual purpose, as, as my friend just said there. Uh, if I am so sure that if we have a list of uh, profitable companies around the globe and much less profitable companies around the globe and compare those two lists into the, into the way how ethical they have been working and how much they contribute to the society, I am sure that the profitable ones will win many times over the less profitable ones. Because this is a Pavlov's uh, needs basis. If you are not profitable, if you are struggling, you don't contribute. You, you, are, you are trying to get things done by, by moving around, being flexible, doing under, under the table jobs, etc. And you don't contribute to the society. But if you are very profitable, you can contribute much more. And the problem here is that it's not about this profit versus everything else, societal impact and innovation, etc. It's how much the investors investors who invested into those profitable companies will allow those profits to be used in for the for the good of the society so investor investor education is much more than than the than the, the top management education tell I me think. tell me just do you feel under pressure from this kind of debate as a chief executive no i am not because uh, i feel comfortable in what we do we, we are profitable and we contribute a lot to the society as well. Right, move, the microphone. move, the, move the microphone back quickly, please, to there. You've got two. I'm Marvin Romano. I'm the chief executive officer of a large uh, Canadian international oil and gas company. We've achieved a lot of success in many parts of the world, some developing countries, and how we develop projects and how we move them forward, making sure they're sustainable, making sure we consult with local communities, we reduce the pace. Uh, and it's really led to more and more business opportunities for us. One of the things that would be helpful for us to move even further and faster and quicker, I think in the last 10 or 15 years, I probably had 7,000 meetings with investors and analysts and shareholders and prospective shareholders, and I cannot recall out of one of those where a question came to me and said, Marvin, what are you doing to build a better world? Marvin, what are you doing on the sustainability front? we could use a little more encouragement from the capital markets because that's what we fundamentally compete for to be able to do our stuff in society and while we create these valuable products for society to procure a little bit for our shareholders. Do you feel under pressure on this issue? 
Well, I think there's an advantage to moving forward. So I actually think if you can do a good job on this front, you can build competitive advantage. But it would be really helpful if the capital markets, I think, recognize that a little more because okay. I don't see them paying for it. Could you pass the microphone back to Nadia? Nadia, you've been very prolific, and I'm coming to you at this point because I'm not going to read every single. Could you, could you Nadia, could, from Ghana? Um, I just want to look up there, number 150. Uh, no, it's moved. Um, number 160. Why are we brainstorming? We're agreeing. We know the answers. We need action. Are you frustrated sitting there, Nadia? Well, I guess, a little bit. So what, what have we failed to do and deliver from your perspective, coming from Ghana, from the position you have? Um, I don't know if it is that we're failing. I don't know if it is that it is our responsibility as companies, as opposed to as individuals, to make this change. Um, but uh, ever since I got, got myself involved in social, uh, socioeconomic development, I go to all these talks, I go to all these summits, I go to all these, and I'm sure a number of the people in this room do it. And I'm sure we're so full of resolve and solutions and strategies. Why are certain things still, why are certain things still going wrong all around the world? Why are we spending so much money? So many of these companies are having all these CSR initiatives, all these sustainable initiatives, investing a lot of money. Corporate social investment is a term right now, not corporate social responsibility anymore. I'm not seeing anything. All right. Well, you've laid down a very significant challenge. I'll come to you, Hieronimo, in a moment, please. What, one thought here. Samir Brico, Chief Executive of AMEC. Uh, I have, a, I have a, a couple of remarks, I have an offer, and I have a couple of requests. Uh, the first thing you would have been asking Siri this question, they would be telling you it's the investors, the shareholders, and actually you and us. One of the things which Marvin has been saying is that exactly the same thing. I go quite a lot of meetings with all shareholders, nobody asks me this question, and nobody's interested even in that question, and nobody's judging me on that question. So, what is my offer? My offer is, I'm going to write to the 100 chairmen of the FTSE 100 in the UK, asking them in order to introduce new values, new KPIs, in making a judgment about whether the companies are doing well or not. And that could be also part of the bonuses, which are also the management team are based on. Now, what is my request? I have a couple of requests. One. We need to have, if other people are actually writing to the New York Stock Exchange market, to Singapore, to Shanghai, to wherever it is in the world, because the London Stock Exchange market is not working in silence. The second thing is that what we need to do. You need to vote, because nobody of you who are actually owners of the shares is actually taking an active role in voting on what we are, done, what we are designing as a management team. And I think that's a good change which we could do. Could you be having an easy ride? Because to pick up Richard's point, if this kind of environment with this kind of input from outside, not just attending a meeting, were to be the way of uh, annual meetings of the future, you could feel under a lot more pressure very quickly. Well, that's exactly the start. I mean, if we feel now as chief executive that there is a great opportunity to create value and at the same time think about the environment, think about other values which we are creating, that's a good start which we can actually multiply. All right. Move the microphone across to Geronimo. Malini Mayor at the back. Matthew Bishop, you've been uh, tweeting quite a lot as well. Can I come to you as well? The microphone to Matthew. Thank you. To, to Malini first. Uh, yeah, I want to pick up on a few of those points. And I'm, I'm a young global leader from, from India. I quickly want to share also this with my uh, counterpart here from China in, in the spirit of shared value. The point I want to make is action. Action to address this trust and um, an action gap. I think the part of the problem is that, you know, we first of all reality check, folks. We are all part of the 1%. We are all in this room because we are part of elites and we individually are influential within our networks. So I think part of the challenge is we need to personalize this issue. Why we go nowhere when we get out of rooms like this in Davos is because it becomes too abstract. But remember, the individual is the source of the aggregate at the national level. So my challenge to you is this. One of the reasons why business and uh, governments are so deplored right now is because people feel quite rightly that they're getting away with murder. They're not governing the, 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 uh, uh, the policies and the economies well, and they're not paying their way. What are some of the ways in which we give back? Individually, I want each of you to think, how are you giving back? This isn't an abstract level about you know, what your company is doing in terms of CSR. What are you doing? Number one, are you paying your taxes? 
Every single person in this room should be paying their fair share of taxes because that creates the Commonwealth. Secondly, each of us should be involved in our communities. I would have far greater respect for people who, who stand up and say they speak for social responsibility if I knew that they were actually really involved in their grassroots communities, in the homes and neighbourhoods that they live in. And I would also propose a change to the next brag sheet for the World Economic Forum's kind of list of who's here. Instead of bragging about what we do, which panels we're on, which awards we're doing. Let's say this is how much I pay in taxes and this is what I contribute locally. I'm involved in XYZ community. And I think that will have a fundamental change in our mindset and the values that we espouse at fora like this. And the role of this social media environment, which has been a bit of a test today, Malini, in Nick, this is all about disclosure. It's fantastic that we've got so many eyes who are watching this and engaging. Let's go one step further in terms of personal disclosure. Matthew Bishop, uh, New York Bureau Chief and America Business Editor of The Economist. You've been tweeting about technology. Well, I, I, technology has been part of it, but actually I've been tweeting much more really about um, three other things. One is that um, you know, fundamentally uh, the, I think there's been a failure uh, of shareholders to take things seriously, take long-term sustainability seriously, and that we are all shareholders. Um, I think over the last 20 years, we've all become used to being ethical shoppers. We buy coffee, uh, and we ask about all sorts of other products, and we say, well, how have they been produced? But we don't do that with our own money when we've handed over to a pension fund, and we need a revolution of ethical uh, investing, ethical capitalism to go alongside uh, ethical consumption. A second point that I've been tweeting about is that most company boards, big company boards, are still uh, homes of groupthink. They're largely male dominated, they're largely people over the age of 55, and they fundamentally don't get how the world has changed. And so I propose that every uh, company board should have at least one person under the age of 30, and ideally one social entrepreneur on it. Um, and uh, that we might find that companies behave in a much more, uh, what I call, philanthro-capitalistic uh, way. And I'd, lastly, I'd like to add that I do think the point about the media is absolutely right. The media is a pro-cyclical force. We focus on the good news when things are going well and the bad news when things are going badly. And we need to actually have a serious debate about how the media focuses on long-term performance and sustainability of our companies rather than getting carried away with all this uh, meaningless short-term noise. Thank you, Matthew. Um, just before I go to Geronimo, because I need to understand if you're still impatient, let me just tell you there are 1,500 people now watching this outside. In other words, the audience is building towards the end. Quite often it uh, falls away. Secondly, I mean, you may think this is a bit of a gimmick having social media here, but what it's done for me as a moderator, it's allowed me, for those of you who've decided to tweet both inside and outside, to get a sense of the kind of reaction, it doesn't need a hand going up, but it's allowed me to input and guide the discussion in directions which are clearly on your mind, even in 140 characters. So that's from my perspective, being transparent about it, why this has been such a useful experiment. I'll come finally to Barry and Richard to find out, and then we'll go to Bill. But first of all, Geronimo, as you said, you're impatient, uh, coming from Euphoria, your company. Are you still impatient? Or even more impatient? Even more impatient. And um, you should be feeling my pulse right now because it's very high. Um, it's not just impatient. I'm, I'm, out, I'm actually angry right now. Um, if there are people, because I, I like your question regarding um, do you feel under pressure? You know? And when people say they don't feel under pressure, then I say something's wrong because I feel under pressure. And I'm not a CEO of a huge company. I really feel on the question, and I know that one day I'm going to be a bit older, I'm going to be in a position of responsibility, and the next generation is going to hold me accountable. And they're going to not be as nice as we are right now. Because they're going to be facing challenges, they're going to be so much bigger than the ones we're facing right now, it's just going to be a disaster. And I see all these people, everyone is pointing at someone else. Everyone's saying, yeah, but it's the investors. And the others say, no, it's the business leaders. And then they say, no, they're the politicians. And I don't want to point at anyone, but I want to point at myself. And I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. There's some of us, Global Shapers, we have over 100,000 followers on Twitter. The comparative advantage 
of you integrating social business into your, into your business model, it's not going to take 10 years. It's, it's happening right now. We're making conscious decisions when we choose what products we buy from what company. I think the next step is that it really becomes massive. And I'm going to engage. I'm going to talk to my generation in Switzerland. I'm going to mobilize them to make this happen and to contribute our part that the framework changes to make it possible for you to take the decisions you pretend to really want to take. Geronimo, thank you. Could you pass the uh, microphone to Barry, please? Barry Salzberg uh, from Deloitte. Final thought of what you've heard and what it might mean for the next sampling. Then we'll go to Richard and finally to Bill. So I, I, I really uh, thought that the conversation was great, uh, stimulating and lots of different perspectives. Uh, one of the thoughts that I would add to the, to the, the dialogue, which I think the gentleman on at table number seven uh, made, uh, is I think that there's a, a level of accountability that is required. Uh, I, I am all for profit with purpose. I, I do believe that there is a fundamental societal impact that business makes from the core business of business. And I think that it's time that we as business leaders report uh, on it and identify the societal impact that we make beyond corporate social responsibility related issues, all very much part of that. But I think it's time for us to be able to step up and indicate what the core business of business contributes to society. I think if we can do that, it will foster a level of trust. It will increase the level of focus by business on societal related issues. And as a result of that, drive innovation, entrepreneurship, and ultimately jobs. Thank you, Barry. Richard, has the case been made? Has there been movement towards what you said at the beginning? You know, to me, the big problem is that the basic perception out there is both business and government are unable to tell the hard truths. And I think the goal for business ought not to be trying to regain the license to operate. It ought to be to get the license to lead. And the license to lead is gained by taking on the hard issues, talking straight to your constituencies, having radical transparency, and also making sure that your employees are out there as your partners in helping sell the uh, proposition. It can't go back to 08 and just party on as was. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Barry. Uh, Bill, uh, your final reflections from the relative luxury of Harvard. First of all, not from Harvard, from Davos. First of all, I compliment you, Nick and Wave, run this session because I think in many ways it's a metaphor for how organizations are going to operate in the future, both with their internal people, with their customers, and with their, all their constituencies. And I think this kind of lack of hierarchy, this kind of engaged dialogue and all the people coming in from the outside really is a metaphor for how we're going to operate in the future. Actually, many of you had to argue for a new model of business. There is a new model emerging. Uh, I think Michael Porter put the issue on the table a year ago when he talked about creating shared value. It's no longer about uh, CSR is a staff function. It's about the mainstream core of business. That's what you said, Barry. And this is what it's all about. And I think the capital markets are ever more short term. That's not going to change anytime soon. But I think we in business have the, whether it's small business or long term, we have the obligation to create a sustainable company. And Ryan Murthy, founder of Infosys, said the best measure of business is longevity. Took General Motors 50 years to go out of business, but eventually they did because they were not focusing on their customers. They're focusing on the short-term shareholders. And so to have sustained success, the model that I see is you start with your mission and values. That is what motivates people. That's what allows you to attract the best people. And they're the ones that create customer satisfaction by creating great products and great service. And that, in turn, leads to profitability. But the externalities that several of you have mentioned must be an integral part of that equation if you're going to have long-term success. If you want to cut corners in short-term, get away with it. Many, many, the good news, many, the corporate leaders of today recognize this is precisely the case. The leaders of companies like, you know, talk to, you know, leaders of companies like Walmart. They used to be the company everyone loved to hate. They recognize these things are perfect. And everyone's saying today, this is good business. It's not bad business. This is good business to incorporate all these things, and that's how companies are going to sustain long-term success. So actually, I come away optimistic that we have. I love the global shapers, young global leaders. I love the, you know, if you will, the millennium and the, the Gen X. And I think the, the new CEOs are really recognizing that my generation made a lot of mistakes, and we're finding ways to come out of it. Back to final comment on trust, Richard. You cannot command trust. 
Trust is going to have to be earned a brick at a time until we get it back. And we're going to have to, we're going to, have to build that, not by making trade-offs between constituencies, but capable leaders are going to have to satisfy the needs of all their constituencies. And just before you leave, when we hear uh, Bill, when we hear uh, Hieronimo here at the front saying he's even more impatient after this discussion, I started off by raising the issue of mindsets. How swiftly can mindsets change? Is there even a realization of why they must change? Is his pulse going to be racing even faster yeah, in the coming least, days and At months? first I was skeptical, Geronimo, that you were you're going to be criticizing everyone else. Then you said, no, I'm going to step up and do it. That's what we all have to do. Don't wait for the hierarchy. And if you're in a company of 50,000 people, don't wait for somebody else to do it. You've got to step up and do it. The great organizations, large or small, will have people that step up and take the lead, and they will empower people at all levels. Because the new leaders are not hierarchical leaders. They're people that operate much more like the Internet than they do like the old hierarchy of the past. All right, thanks, Bill. Uh, can I just tell you that we're going to capture all the tweets and all the incoming social media uh, on Storyfy, so if you want to go back and look at the kind of record there is uh, out there of what uh, came in, both from inside the room and outside, you can see it there, Storyfy, uh, http uh, wef ch, you know that, slash brainstorm. And also, this is only the first springboard for many more discussions like this. I hope we've energized it, pointed it in the right direction, got you disagreeing with each other. Maybe the pulses are racing a little bit, but make sure if you want to continue this discussion, there are at least six more events which are going to be addressing exactly this. Finally, the last tweet that I've got, thanks for the live stream, gives small fry like me to express gray matter, not an everyday event in the analogical world. And I thank you all very much indeed, and for staying here throughout the 90 minutes and moving it forward in the way you have. I appreciate it. Thank you.